Happy Sunday, Trinity Church. So glad you have taken a portion of your day to join us online. We have an incredible service planned for you. And whether you are watching from your home, your job, or anywhere else, maybe invite a friend to join you by copying the link and sending it to someone. Maybe even start a watch party. Either way, let's take a moment to worship God together.
your joy and your presence in this room. Lord, we know that you are the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, receive our worship.
if you are in need of God right now, would you raise your hands? This song told us, and we sang it, that he's the same God. He healed the lepers then. He helped Moses get all the people across the Red Sea. He's the same God. So raise your hands high if you need something from God. And I want to encourage you today to say, you know what? Moses was not more special than you to God. Jacob was not more special to you, to God, than you are. So raise your hand high. And as we pray, just speak out loud what it is that you're crying out to God for. Remind yourself that you are his child. You are not a beggar. Just say it. Just say it. Lord God, we come to you with our hands raised and we declare you are the same God. And you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for us, for our sin. And with that, you told us that our value is beyond measure. It cannot be measured how much you love us. So today, we come with our cares. We come with our concerns. We come with our sicknesses. We come in our poverty of our heart, the poverty of our mind, and we say, God, help us. Help us, God, to be more like you, to reflect you in all that we do. So with that, we can attract more people to the kingdom of God. Help us, Lord, today. Show your love to us and through us to others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, it's a beautiful day to be in the church, to see each other. It's so nice to see you as the lights come up. Look around and say, hey, you're a pretty beautiful child of God. As our in-person service heads to FaceTime, we wanted to take a moment to welcome those who are watching for the first time. If that's you, we consider you a VIP guest. We are so thankful for you, and we just want to be a resource and get connected with you. If you would, text VIP to 66866 to let us know you joined us today, and we are so thankful for you. For things upcoming here at Trinity Church, check out this week's news. Hey, Trinity Church. Easter week is coming soon, and we have so much for you and your family to enjoy. On Palm Sunday, April 10th, we will be showing our stage production of The Living Last Supper, something you and your family don't want to miss. That same week, we will be having our Good Friday services on April 15th. There will be two one-hour express services, one at 12 p.m. and the other at 7.30 p.m. Then on Saturday, April 16th, we have an Easter egg hunt. The day will start with games, food, and so much more, all leading up to the massive Easter egg hunt. And finally, Easter Sunday, we will not only have one, not two, but three in-person services. We'll start at 7 a.m. with our sunrise service and continue for 9.30 a.m. and 11.30 a.m. This is going to be our best Easter season yet and would love for you and your family to be at as many of these events as possible. For more information on any of these events, you can download our app or check out our website at trinitychurch.tv. Can't wait to see you there. My daughter's intentional character development has been amazing here. She was not socializing as much as she could have been, especially for young kids. You expect them to, you know, look forward to look go out to the playground and play with other kids, although they may not know them. That was one thing for me that was important to my daughter, to move her out of the more smaller setting so that she can get 
to socialize more, possibly just interact. I just wanted her to have interaction with children and feel comfortable and not take them as strangers and, and have a fear. Initially thought to myself I wanted to transfer her from that smaller setting, TCA was my first choice. I have an older daughter who attended TCA's summer camps for five years in a row and we loved it. She loved it. And my daughter was also non-sociable in some ways. Started off non-sociable like my little daughter, my youngest daughter, the summer camp helped my oldest daughter tremendously. So again, when I did see my youngest daughter had the same non-social skills, I thought to myself, okay, I'm gonna take her out of this little setting, the smaller setting, and put her into TCA because it helped Bella a lot. She went from not wanting to see anyone, not giving anyone eye contact, but children, you know, it's a little more reserved. They don't speak at all. So I've seen Blossom come out of her shell tremendously and I knew Trinity would do it. And I love it. My daughter is so vocal. She's so attentive. She's the little lady in charge. I even got a compliment from uh, the teacher that she started with last year. And she's like, you should see Blossom. Blossom is just, she talks to everybody, she eats. And I'm like, yeah, I know, cause she tells me. And I love the fact that she come home and she's like, great mommy. I was like, you had lunch today? Yes, we had such and such, chicken and rice, vegetables, applesauce, and, and Giselle sat next to me. And we played in the playground and, and Mrs. Cater. And she goes on about the staff, on about the students and I love it. My daughter's professional character development has taken off and I will say yes glory to God but truly Trinity had a lot to do with it. So I will honestly say yes Trinity is the place for any child. I would recommend this school to anybody. Anybody and when I had my second daughter I knew this is, there was gonna be no other school for her. And I was thankful. The list was opening, the waiting list wasn't hard, the registration wasn't difficult, the staff was easy to speak to. It was like, okay, look, this is home. I will say the academic parts of TCA, I'm thrilled with, more than thrilled because my daughter wants to read, she wants to have her homework done, and that's not really what you hear from children, especially four. My daughter is four years old, and I've never heard nobody beg me to do homework at four. It is a thrilled feeling to know that your child is excited to do packets, 10 page or more. Not only have I had personal interactions with some of this, the staff here at TCA, but just the system itself. The doors just shut after each child. Each child is escorted into their perspective areas like, I can't ask for more. I mean, I could hire personal security, but I think TCA got that under control. I am Shirley Janite. I am the parent of Blossom Zuri and Bella Zaina and I am a proud TCA parent. One of the best parts that I liked about that testimony from that mom was when she said, all glory be to God. But Trinity had a lot to do with it. I thought that was a great line. Oh, I maybe it didn't touch you like it touched me. Anyway, uh, what a great testimony from this mother. And uh, moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas, like I said, get your kids signed up for TCA. And uh, this summer's outreaches are amazing, amazing. We have day camp for seven weeks for you know, kindergarten through high school, literally. I'm serious. Monday through Friday for seven weeks. Just powerful, powerful time. And uh, I'm so excited about it. Well, when you came in today on your chair, um, there was a Passover uh, pledge card. I want you to take it out. Now, if you've already filled one of these out, that's good, but still take it out because I'm going to need you to do something with it. I, this will be the first Sunday we're doing this with it, okay? Um, you're going to see about oh, a little bit more than halfway down, you're going to see the area where you can pledge for the offering on Easter Sunday. I'd like you to tear it on that perforated line, if you would, 
All right? And then that part that has the pledge, I want you to half that again because there is a place to pledge. And then the other part is the prayer request. And today we start our prayer requests on the crosses like we have the past 18 years. But let's go over this one more time, the seven Passover blessings. And uh, you need to know that this is our 18th year to follow Deuteronomy 16 and 16, three times a year. Moses told the Israelites, you are to bring on these particular days your finest offering ever uh, above your tithe. Passover, which is Easter Sunday. And that offering goes for our outreach. We have a threefold mission at Trinity Church, win the lost, help the poor, teach abundant living. And those three lines are broken down into three words. Outreach, compassion, and abundance. The Passover offering goes for outreach in the summer. That's when we do all the camps. That's when we do all the outreaches of this church. And much of it is not covered uh, by the expenses that are paid for. We, ha we have to come up with. And so we do that with our Passover offering. That's our offering for outreach. In 50 days after Easter is Pentecost. This was the second high feast day. Feast of weeks is called in, in scripture. This offering was always an offering identified in the Old Testament with the poor, with those that were in bondage, with those that were going to be set free 50 years, all right? The number 50 is this jubilee, seven victor, and seven weeks, 49, 50 days after Passover is Pentecost. That offering that we'll receive that day goes for the needy, those in desperate need, our peacemakers, family services, and, and, and that's very important. That we've done this for 18 years. And then the fall offering is the atonement offering. That's the offering that meets this third mission of our church, which is the abundant life. Abundance. And that's how we take care of this facility. All right? Because the mortgage payments that we pay do not take care of the repair bills or new air conditioning. Or, so that third offering in the fall helps us with this building facility hallelujah that's how we break it down but there are seven blessings in exodus chapter 23 verses 20 through 30 that are connected to this offering these blessings comes contingent upon your participation and what i mean is for you it could be huge participation to give twenty dollars on easter sunday some could give five thousand it wouldn't cost you much you see what I'm saying? In other words, this is something that you have to reach for a little bit and let God know he's number one, all right? So here it is. An angel, first thing that happens, has been assigned to you to keep you and lead you to your miracle. I have about 45 people every Wednesday night on my personal connect group on Zoom. And we've been talking about the fact of God's angelic force and that we on earth are to witness to that angelic force in heaven God's grace in our life it's an amazing thought from Ephesians 3 10 and 11 but the point is every one of us who give will have an angel assigned to us secondly God will be an enemy to your enemies how many are thankful you got someone on your side when someone's coming against you? Amen. I know that I'm glad for that. Number three, he will give prosperity to you. I have always chosen prosperity over po poverty. Can I get an amen? Thank you. And fourth, God will take sickness away from you. We had so many people healed during the T Ted Shuttlesworth evangelistic uh, miracle meeting. Most of you know Irata. Uh, Garcia, Carlos, and Ireda. Carlos runs all of our videoing, and Ireda is the director of our marriage ministry, Simba, Save Your Marriage Before It Starts. Hundreds of couples have been through that teaching, but she's been stricken with problems in her walk. She's been in pain for months, limping around. You've seen her. God healed her in that series. She's walking around in high heels like nothing ever happened. I mean, healed by the power. God wants to do that for you as well. 
Number five, you shall not die before your appointed time. Long lifespan. Now, you know I'm 49, but I'm going to be here for quite a while. Let me just tell you, I'm believing for a long life. What I mean, what I meant, what, you know that I've passed 49, but I'm going to keep passing. Amen. I mean, not passing away. I'm going to keep going. Can I get an amen? Hallelujah. Number six, increase and inheritance will be you, yours. Number seven, a one-year blessing. Your promises that the enemy has stolen will be taken from the enemy and returned to you. These are God's promises from Exodus chapter 23 when you are part of this offering on Easter Sunday, Passover. So I encourage you to make a pledge. If you've already made a pledge, don't make another one. But if you haven't made a pledge, make a pledge on that little card. Put your name on the other side. We will not come after you. We never call, hey, where's the money? We've never done that, never done that. It just gives us an idea of how much we can do in the summer, uh, what we can plan for in the summer based upon the way you pledge uh, before the offering. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, today, in just a moment, we will also be worshiping in our giving, and I'll talk about that. But during our giving today, we start our trek towards the cross. You see this, my Passover prayer request, right? And I want you to have that separate from the other parts. So there were two tears on this pledge form. I want you to fill in your Passover prayer requests. I don't want you to wrap this too tightly, but wrap it. And when we stand for the offering to be passed, I want you to start coming and putting your prayer request in the cross. We, during Passion Week, our staff will burn them in the parking lot. We'll show the video. This will be part of my message on Easter Sunday, the burning of these prayer requests. We believe that on Easter Sunday, as we give, God is going to answer Whatever wacky prayer request you think it is, God's going to make it happen. Over and over, I've heard people give me testimonies about stuff. Pastor, I needed it, but I never dreamed it would happen. But it happened. God is a good God. He hears and answers prayer. I love this passage in the Word of God, and I've shared it with you before, but it's in 1 Chronicles 29, 14. And David writes to the Lord, but who am I? And who are my people? That we should be able to give as generously as this. Everything comes from you. And we have given you only what comes from your hand. That's what David said. He goes, who am I? And folks, I promise you, I pray this prayer at least once a month. I said, God, Who am I? Are you serious? Who's Trinity Church? That you'd let us be this generous. Everything we have came from you. We're giving back to you what you gave us. We couldn't even give if you didn't give to us. See, we give way too much credit to our hard work. We gave too much credit to our ingenuity in business. We give too much credit to our boss who writes the checks. And thank God for all of it. But ultimately, it came from him. It came from him. It came from him. So today, we don't have to give. We get to give. Because he gave to us when we didn't deserve it. Hallelujah. Well, I love you so much. Stand to your feet with me, everyone. We're going to pray, and then we're going to worship. And as the buckets pass down your road, then I want you to come to the crosses and put your prayer request in the cross. If you haven't pledged, put your pledge in the offering bucket with your offering. And... Then come with your prayer request. Now, I'll say it one more time. Stand to your feet. I say that in Christian love. 
and we're going to ask God to bless. Please take your envelope and or your cell phone, however you're giving today. Those of you online, raise it up. Let's thank God that we have something to give to him today. Believe God with the Father in Jesus' name. Who am I? Who's Trinity Church? That we should be able to be this generous. Oh God, you're the one that gave us what we have so we could give to you. Bless your people as they're faithful again today. For your glory's sake, we ask it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. Sing along with our worship team and then bring your prayer request to the cross.
church, doesn't our God deserve all worship and praise and adoration to honor to worship with you this Sunday morning? We invite you now to take a seat and turn your attention to the screen. is my final message in the series titled Why He Came. And I'm very excited because my youngest son began this series four weeks ago. He pastors our church in New York City and he preached on the subject, Jesus came to find the lost. Then I picked it up and preached, Jesus came for those who wanted more. Then last week, I said Jesus came to bring radical change. Uh, you're going to love the message today, and I'll announce it in just a minute. But next week, my oldest son, John Fulton, who pastors our church in Tacoma, Washington, and who was raised in this church and started his ministry here, um, will be preaching. And he may extend this series one more week, I can't say, or probably just preach something new from his heart. Uh, but he has been watching his brother and me and what we've been talking about, so he may extend this series one more week. Either way, I'll be on the front row with Dr. Robin cheering that boy on and can't believe he's 40 years old or 41. Yeah, that's killing me. So today, I want to talk on this subject. Jesus came to turn the lights on. And this is part four in this series. Of course, in two weeks, we will celebrate Palm Sunday with the Living Last Supper. Then the following week, it will be Easter. So we're in that season where we celebrate the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's a wonderful passage of scripture that I want you to look at with me today, if you have your Bibles, or it will come on the screens. What I'm going to read you, first of all, are the words of Isaiah found in Isaiah 8 and verse 19. And the scripture says this, when someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of of the living. Now here Isaiah was preaching a prophetic word that actually involved his own children. He was talking about a people who should be walking in the light, but instead they had turned their backs on the Lord and are now living in deep darkness. And as bad as things were, he began to prophesy in Isaiah 9, 1 and 2, that a day would be coming, which would be about 600 or so years into the future, where Jesus would appear. And Isaiah prophesied about it in Isaiah 9, the next chapter, verses 6 and 7. You know this passage. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and peace. There will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Now, with that passage from Isaiah as a backdrop, 
Let's move 600 or so years into the future from that time. Jesus had just been tempted in the wilderness for 40 days and nights by the devil himself. He faced off with Satan and all of his temptations that he had to offer. And Jesus defeated the enemy with the word of God. Now that series of temptations was over and Jesus heard at the same time that John the Baptist had been thrown into prison by Herod. And the scripture says in Matthew 4, verses 12 through 17, follow along with me. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. What was Jesus doing? Well, his cousin and best friend, John the Baptist, had stirred something up in Jerusalem. And so Jesus pulled back. Galilee is about 50 or 60 miles from Jerusalem. He let things calm down a bit. The Bible says he settled in Capernaum by the lake. That would be Sea of Galilee. Now look at this. Verse 13. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. Verse 14, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. I just read it to you. Now, what I'm going to say here is in Matthew, but as as the scripture says, it was originally prophesied by Isaiah 600 years earlier in Isaiah 9, 1 and 2. So here it is, Matthew 4, 15. Jesus speaks, land of Zebulun, and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. The Bible says in verse 17, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has Come near. Now, church, I hated to keep interrupting the text I was reading from, but I wanted to explain what Jesus was saying about light that had been prophesied over 600 years earlier by the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah basically said that Things will get so bad and dark and satanic and demonic on the earth that the people will live in spiritual darkness 24-7. That's what Isaiah was saying. And did that happen? Indeed it happened. The last verse in Malachi, which is the end of the Old Testament, In that last verse, the last word of the Old Testament is the word curse. From that time until the Bible reopens with the New Testament, 400 years between the Testaments, old and new, God said nothing to the earth. It was men and demons. It was hell on earth. But then came Jesus. Why did he come? He came to turn the lights back on. Hallelujah. How did he do that? Look with me again to Isaiah 9, verse 7, part 8. Of the greatness of his government, Isaiah writes, and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Hallelujah. There are two key words that helped Jesus illuminate the future of the world when he came. Let's look at them. First, Jesus came to turn the lights on by promoting justice for all. 
Now, when you're living in a dark world, it means that the majority of the people have no justice. And injustice has to do with it's not fair. Living isn't fair. Education isn't fair. Work isn't fair. The pay scale isn't fair. Marriage isn't fair. The way children are treated isn't fair. Poverty isn't fair. And that's why Jesus came to turn the lights on and push injustice out the door and light in the door. Now, some of you in the room are from Haiti. And I probably bring this nation up first because we're closest to it. And I've been there so many times. And like you, my heart breaks for this wonderful nation. Just give you a couple pictures here from Haiti. This is what many streets in Haiti look like this. I wasn't there too long ago. It still looks like that. Look at this next one. So many places throughout Haiti have tent cities. Still. And the vast majority of Haitian people live in tremendous poverty. That's wrong. Whoever leads the nation of Haiti now that their poor president has been assassinated surely doesn't live like that. My God. That's injustice. Calcutta, India, which is where my wife's aunt and uncle served from 1955 until last year when Aunt Hulda died at 96 years of age. Look at one of the, it's one of the pictures from Calcutta. That is a typical street scene of junk. That's everywhere. Nine miles by four miles is 36 square miles. 16 million people live on that little piece of dirt the size of the Dallas-Fort Worth airport. Look at another picture. These are called busties. We call them in America ghettos. That's what they call them in Calcutta, busties. In our worst places here in America, it's not that bad. I've seen hundreds and hundreds of these busty ghettos in Calcutta, but they're all over India. Here's the prime minister. I'm sure he's a nice man. He seems to be just by looking at him. All put together, the prime minister. Let me just show you his house, just so you know. I'm sorry, but that's just not right. That's not justice. That's not fair. Look at some of the poverty of Russia. It's hard to find pictures of poverty in Russia just because they don't want people seeing it. They keep the Internet clean. Here's another one. This is a, a neighborhood. I've been in Ukraine. I've been in the neighborhoods. Here's another one. Here's what a house looks like with people sleeping. Here's another one. Here's just a group of people without work sitting in a corner. That's Russia. Here's their president looking good, feeling good. Here's one of his eight residences in Russia. That's his palace on the Black Sea. That's what's called communism. That's what's called being fair. See what that is? That's called a couple people have billions, and the rest of the planet has nothing. All right? Um, some economists have said about this present-day president that he may have as much as $1 trillion. Yet he is presently leveling the Ukraine. That's injustice. Jesus came to turn the lights on. He came for the equality of humankind. Not everyone on the same level. I get that. But everyone able to live abundantly. That's why he came. That you might have life and life more abundantly. Whatever is not fair to a group of people is injustice for those people. I was on a call this week with 12 powerful 
religious leaders in America, most of them Christian. I was one of two white leaders on the call. We had, I think, two Muslim leaders on the call as well. And the discussion centered around the suppression of voters' legal rights in the United States. Now, church, you know your pastor. Now, look at me. Look at me. You know I cannot stand politics. I'm not a politician. I can't stand it. I've had people say, you should run for office. I would never step down into that mess from the pulpit. I don't promote it to you. You know that. Oh, the last two or three years, people have been hammering. Blah, blah, blah. Stop. I'll preach the word. But when I heard that there was such real, and I've heard it for years, real injustice involved, and I knew that I was preaching on Jesus turning the lights on and making life fair and just for everyone, I had to get on that call. When I was invited all on, I said, you know me, and I told the person calling, I said, you know me. She says, no, Pastor, I know you. I know, I know, but please, just, you. we need you on this call for the state of Florida. Why should it be more fair for me than for someone else when it comes to being able to vote in the United States? I'm just asking. Here's what the Old Testament prophet said. Here's what Moses said in Deuteronomy 16, verses 19 and 20. Do not pervert justice or show partiality. Do not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the innocent. Follow justice and justice alone. Make it fair for everybody, so that you may live and possess the land the Lord your God is giving you. Here are the words of the prophet Micah in Micah chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Woe to those who plan iniquity, to those who plot evil on their beds. At morning's light, they carry it out because it is in their power to do it. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them. They defraud people of their homes. They rob them of their inheritance. Therefore, the Lord says, I am planning disaster against the people from which you cannot save yourselves. You will no longer walk proudly, for it will be a time of calamity for a nation that is unjust to its people. Some of you say, well, Pastor Rich, <laughs> you could say that about American presidents and the poor of America. And I say, yes, but at least you can vote those guys out every four or eight years. Jesus came to turn the lights on to injustice. And I'm telling you people today, the hammer is dropping all over the world. It's the hammer of God. God is moving against injustice, and we're watching it on the nightly and the morning and the noontime and the afternoon time, cable news channels. In fact, we're seeing it 24-7 if you have that kind of taste for the news. But God is in it. Second, Jesus came to turn the lights on for righteous living to be the order of the day for his people. Now look at the following Bible passages with me, if you will. 1 John 1, 9, it's very familiar. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Ephesians 5.8, I love this passage. For you were once darkness, not in darkness, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. Look at this from Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Very familiar. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap 
eternal life. Hallelujah. And finally, I love this passage concerning Jesus in 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's right, church. God is calling us to be holy. He's calling us to live righteously for Jesus Christ. It's not easy, but for the believer, it should be normal. I can do this, but I can't do this. It's okay for me to do this, but I will not do this. You know what I'm saying today? We must individually... Listen to me. We must individually put a Holy Ghost limiter on our lives. This far and no further. And by this far, I'm not saying that we can go to the very edge of corruption and see how close we can get without going further. No. I'm saying stay away from the edge entirely. Don't let yourself get too close to the edge of corruption that it's easy for you to cross over. No. Stay as close to Jesus as you can. Run away from the edge. Run to the arms of Jesus. St. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23 and 4, I have the right to do anything you say. But not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. That's righteousness. Putting the needs of others in front of what you believe your needs are. Because we already know that my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus in heaven. My dear church, Jesus came to turn the lights on for his people to walk in righteousness. This past week, and it gives me no joy to report this, it's all over the news. So I'd rather you hear it from your leader, your servant leader, Pastor Rich. But one of my dear friends, Pastor Brian Houston, stepped down from being the lead pastor of the Hillsong Global church out of Sydney, Australia, which spans the globe in many ways. And his reason for stepping down, according to the board of directors and the new lead pastor of the church, Pastor Phil Dooley, who was for a hundred years was the youth pastor of Hillsong, then moved to South Africa and planted a great church there. The reason for his stepping aside, according to the board of directors, was because of his own moral indiscretions. Now, what happened to Pastor Brian, who was a dear friend of mine and who I have wept for this past week and for several weeks before that because of other issues in the Hillsong Church, which I'm friends with so many of those people. But what happened is that because of, for whatever reasons, he allowed himself to get too close to the edge of moral correctness. And it bit him. Now, I know what some of you are saying, but Pastor Rich, what is the reason on the part of our Heavenly Father in other words, he's now shamed internationally in front of his family, his children, his grandchildren. This is something that the memory of it will not leave 
for the duration of his life on this planet. So you say, what is God's purpose in that? First of all, I want to say, God is way big. He is way huge. This planet is microscopic in comparison to our great God. So please get the picture of how great and huge and big our God. He is limited by nothing. These little peanut earthly rulers are nothing. God loves Pastor Brian Houston far more than God loves Pastor Brian Houston's ministry or the ministry that I offer or anyone who is in spiritual leadership positions. God loves you as an individual much greater than anything you, quote, do for him, to help him. The truth is, he lets us serve him. He lets us be a part. Should I go to serve day? I don't know. Should you? Because whatever you do, he lets you do it. We only serve at his allowance. We only breathe because he gave us another breath. He's way big. He wants you and me to live righteously. He wants a witness on this planet as to what Jesus looks like. How Jesus responds. What kind of pressure points move Jesus and how we should move when those pressure points come. Not legalistically. But in love with Jesus, that kind of living. So that in all things, at all times, I'm asking, what would Jesus do? What would he have me to do? Now, I'm going to make you this promise. Now, I've been here for 23 years, and we got churches all over that came out of this church. I'm going to say to you again what I've said for 23. I will not judge you. I'll warn you, but I'll never judge you. But I am going to judge me all the time. Day in and day out. Rich, 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 rich. Hey, hey. I'll warn you, but it's only to be so that you can keep connected to Jesus wholeheartedly. Jesus came to turn the lights on for righteous living so that you don't have to be ashamed when you go to bed. You may go to bed with a sore jaw from someone popping you in the mouth for telling them you loved them. You may be ridiculed for being a Christian, but you'll never be ashamed. You won't have to go to bed wondering, I wonder if I died, if I'd go to heaven. No, you have peace with God because you have had the lights of righteousness turned on in your life. The rights of justice turned on in your life. Last of all, thirdly, Jesus came to turn the lights on for repentance. Now, I led off this message with scripture taken from Isaiah 9, where Isaiah prophesied 600 years ahead of time that Jesus would come to people who were living in darkness to bring about the great light from heaven. Then it says that he will come with justice and righteousness to reign forever. Then, if you remember the beginning, I moved to Matthew 12, verse, Matthew 4, excuse me, verses 12 through 17. That is the fulfillment of Isaiah 9, 
But then the Bible says after the prophecy was made, these words, Matthew 4, 17, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, church, the only way to really move into the light of justice and real righteousness is through repentance. Repentance is the open door to justice and righteousness. Now, now I'm going to say this. Probably 85, well, maybe at least 80% of you at least, maybe 75, or maybe 80, maybe eight, maybe 70. In this room, I can't, I can't say for those online because I, I just don't know who's watching, but as I, 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 I or in this room, uh, you've already repented. You're already living a life of justice and righteousness. However, there are some of you that just flat need to repent. Was that clear? Some of you in the room that just flat need to repent because your injustice is showing and your unrighteousness is showing too. What's happened? No repentance. Now, what does that mean, Pastor Rich? That means, repentance means change your mind. Stop thinking the way you're thinking. Stop operating life the way you've been operating life. Stop putting others ahead of God. Stop putting yourself ahead of God. Start making God first. Start putting others first. Love, love, love. Get that love of money out of you. Change your mind. Jesus is coming. And he said, the scripture says, from that time on, he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near you. For some of you today, I'm asking, what's it going to take? Will the whole world have to know of your sin? Will all of your kids be ashamed that dad, that mom was shamed? Because you lived too close to the edge of corruption. Will you have to be shamed in front of yourself, your family, your friends, because you thought you could get away with it? Stop! Change your mind! Repent, for the kingdom of heaven today has come to you. I want you to bow your head as we bring this message to a close. I'm not going to beg. You've heard the word. The word's on you. If you're in this room, you need to repent. You need to get right with God. You need to change your mind. And you would like for me to include you in my final prayer. I want you to raise your hand right now. Quickly, raise it as high as you can right now. Quickly. I see yours and 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 yours. I see yours. I see yours right here. I see yours, I see yours, I see yours, I see yours. I can't see them all, so don't just flip it up and flip it down. Let me see it. Anybody else at all? Okay, I see yours, I see yours. You can put it down, you can put it down. Maybe you haven't raised your hand. The Spirit of God is just tugging at your heart, and this will be the last time. You, you need today to change your mind. You need to repent today. Say, Pastor, please include me in this final prayer. If that's you, raise your hand. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, thank God. 
Stand to your feet, everyone standing if you would. And we're going to sing that little chorus, Oh God, my God, I need you. That's a new song we're learning today. I'm telling you, I stood on this front row in the 930 service, and the more we sang it, the more I cried. Because if I ever come to the point where I don't need the Lord, then they ought to just dig a six-foot hole and throw me in it because I'll be dead already. I need him. Oh, God, my God, I need you. They're going to sing that. And if today you need to repent, if today you'd like for me to include you in my final prayer, then I'm going to ask you when they start to sing, Oh, God, my God, and you hear the words come out of their mouth, I'm going to ask that in the overflow, the back, across the front, I want you to step to the aisle nearest you immediately and come and stand at this altar. I want to pray with you personally before you go home today. You say, Pastor, I can't do that. People will see me. That is the whole point. There's something about walking away from where you were to where you want to be in Jesus that will make all the difference in your life. And if you are serious, I want you to step from where you are right now as we sing it together. Come and join me here. Hallelujah. Jesus came to turn the lights on. Oh, man. And he's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know, when the light comes on, creepy stuff can't be hidden anymore. Silent stuff gets loud real quick when the lights come on. And that's what Jesus came to do. And to be honest with you, we need the light. We're not healthy in the middle of creepy stuff. We're not healthy when stuff is allowed to build up in our life in a secret way. We only find freedom when the light gets turned on. And today, maybe while I was speaking, you thought to yourself, he's turning the light on with the power of Jesus as he talks. And I'm seeing some things in my life that are not right. And I need to get them right with God today. This is your day. You're in a private place. Maybe your family's with you, but for the most part, this is you. And you have the opportunity to say, hey, Lord, I need change today. Why don't you pray this prayer out loud with me? It may sound weird because no one's there or maybe your family's there you say it together but say it out loud would you do it dear Jesus I've sinned I'm not proud of it but I admit it today I lay my sin down take it I pray I don't want it anymore thank you for turning the lights on today Jesus I yield everything to you. I receive your forgiveness right now. I ask that you would accept me into your wonderful family. In Jesus' name, amen. If you meant that prayer, you're a forgiven person. You don't have to get on your knees and crawl to the Freedom Tower downtown to do penance. Jesus already went to the cross. You're forgiven. Now it's time to take up your own cross and follow Christ. We can help you with that. I'd like you to do something first, though, for me. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, or you prayed it for the first time in a real long time and you've been away from the Lord, there's a number at the bottom of your screen. That's my personal cell number for 23 years. Would you please just dial my number into your smartphone and then put in the text, Pastor, I prayed the prayer, and hit send, and I'll get it right away. And I'll connect with you 
today or at the latest tomorrow, I promise that, I want you to know that you can find help in a great way. Until next time, this is Pastor Rich reminding you to go with God. God bless.